Hey guys, it's M4J here, and welcome back to the Majefferies Network on OpenTTD. Uh, we got some music in today's episode as well. Sometimes I forget to put the music on, and I don't really know why. It's a bit of a stupid thing. Anyway, welcome to episode 165. Uh, in today's episode, we are going to be building the Great Western Line out of GSP, which is why we're over here. We are also going to be building the Western Suburban Line to link up with this Western Line. So, without further ado, let's get going. Um, I'm also going to put a little addition to the previous episode. So the previous episode we started with the to-do lists. Um, as I say, I'm recording a lot of these in advance, so I haven't had time to gauge your feedback yet. Hopefully it's positive, though. I'm still getting really nice comments about other videos in the series, which is always nice. Uh, and there's also some topics of conversation, which is part of what today's episode is going to be about. There's also going to be a little bit of me moaning as well, but um, I think I'll start with the moaning actually. So let me get out of this a second. If you look very closely on the metro line, uh, down there, just about making out, there is, um, excuse me, there's a tube train running on our metro lines now. All the uh, trains have been upgraded. It was not as simple as I thought it would be. The problem is, you see the track's different as well, as it is over here. For some reason, these tracks, whether it's the speed was the problem, I didn't actually check it with different speeds. I probably should do that really just to like confirm what the issue was. Nope, doesn't seem to be a speed problem. Okay, then I'm going to go into complaining mode. For some stupid reason, uh, where are we? Dual power. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, dual power. There we go. For some stupid reason, the tracks, these ones here, third rail, dual power, catenary, all that stuff, isn't compatible with British trains. So all of these Brit British trains that I've got, including the, uh, the EMUs we've got over here, which are now running on this suburban line. I couldn't get any of them because the um, depots weren't compatible. And I tried just converting the depots and then try and have the trains run on these lines. And the tracks aren't compatible. So there's something not quite right there. But what that means is pretty much everything that I've built in this entire map using these tracks, new tracks, is redundant pretty much the entire thing also that presents some problems for the future because I've only got these tracks and then these ones here the only way I can get overhead lines is if I use the dual power which I really don't want to use to be honest I kind of prefer these tracks here anyway the aesthetics of them look nicer but I wanted to use new tracks. It's the whole reason I started this this new map as well, is to try out new new um, types of track, new types of train, things like that. So again, I turn to Lieutenant Joker for advice. Uh, he knows the game a lot better than I do. I'm aware that there is a way that you can get new GRFs into an existing save game. I'm also aware that it can mess up your save file. However, I would like to try and get more track types um, in if possible because this is really annoying uh, I don't want this map to grind to a halt I'm really just starting to get into this map uh, there's been a few times I'll be honest with you guys there's been a few times where I've kind of wanted to just give up this map and start again because I wasn't really liking it I'm starting to get out of that now I'm starting to get into a frame of mind where I'm beginning to enjoy this map I really don't want it to be messed up so, not just Lieutenant Joker, I'll open it up to anyone. If anyone knows a way that I can get either the, the tracks to work with the British trains or to get more tracks in that I can use without having to start again, I would really appreciate that. Uh, because this, otherwise this series is a little bit in trouble. Anyway, enough about that. Let's work on this, shall we? So this is going to have two different train types running on this line. I've just noticed that that platform there is out of place. So let's fix that really quickly. 
And then we're going to get into, today, into today's topics of conversation, which is the new part of today's episode, or the new part that's going to be introduced in today's episode. Uh, okay, so this is pretty much going to go in a straight line out. There will be a depot that will serve both St. Michael and St. Peter, and it will be built in this gap somewhere. <coughs> so in a second, this, this line is actually going to head southwards around the oil refinery, and is then going to start heading west again. <coughs> and these two tracks here are the tracks that are going to go off to the depot. Right, let's start talking about conversation topics, shall we? So I've been reading comments from people. Um, a few of them I haven't responded to, and this is one of the reasons why. It's because I've been saving them up for the first conversation topics. Um, and we're actually going to start with someone who I'm aware is a long way behind in the series. So it's going to be quite a while before you read these comments. But Wayne Hervey, we're going to start with. Um, because he's come up with two very interesting topics of conversation for us to discuss. So... I'm acting like I'm all prepared, but in actual fact I've just realised I need to actually get the comment up on my phone. So the first comment was about... Um, it was in episode 102 this was commented. Uh, but that's where Wayne's up to. In fact, I think he's up to 104 now. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, the comment reads thus. Uh, you see how complicated this was. Planning routes, bridges, tunnels and stations, amongst other things. This was during the Dartborn rebuild, if anyone remembers that far back. Uh, I struggle to remember, but I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the episode, let's put it that way. I do remember making an episode where I spent a long time, I think it was about two hours in total, rebuilding Dartborn. And then I spent, I think it was four hours rebuilding Fort Hampton later on, just to then scrap all of that work and rebuild it again a little bit later on. Anyway, um, so Wayne continues, imagine being a real life route planner and having to include compulsory purchase and other land purchases into the mix. Now they've capped your budget, this campaigning to stop you taking the easier route through the countryside must be an absolute nightmare. Not quite as easy as clicking on the magic bulldozer. Um, well actually, in modern Britain, okay yeah, there's things like compulsory purchase orders and things like that, but back in Victorian Britain, um, it was more a case of a magic bulldozer. You'll go out one day to the market or to the theatre or whatever and you'll come home and find your house doesn't exist anymore because there's a railway station or a bit of track that's going to be built where your house was. So they just knocked your house down. Um, I think there was a little bit more of a formality than that. They did sometimes give you advanced warning. A bit like the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, they give you a bit of an advanced warning, give you time to prepare and leave. And then they'll come and just knock your house down. Uh, so St Pancras is a good example of that. In fact, I think a church was one of the victims when they built St Pancras. There was a graveyard underneath St Pancras International Station somewhere. Uh, I think it's still there. They might have moved it when they rebuilt it for High Speed 1. Um, but yeah, there used to be a graveyard like directly underneath the station. Uh, in fact, just underneath the beer cellar, if you're wondering why St Pancras is raised up and not sort of sunk into the ground like King's Cross is, that's the reason. There is, um, well it's, it's actually to do with the canal, Grand Union Canal, just a little bit further up the way. The lines out of King's Cross go under the canal, whereas the lines out of St Pancras go above the canal. I'm pretty sure the majority of people knew that anyway. But, um... When they built the St Pancras platforms raised, they then used the space underneath for a beer cellar, which I think is... I mean, you certainly wouldn't see that in this day and age. Uh, of course, it's no longer used as a beer cellar, it's now used as the uh, the main concourse for the station. Before that, that is exactly what it was used for. So that's the first topic of conversation. It's about modern railways in Britain and, and how they're built. Uh, so, for example, yes, I have the Magic Bulldozer tool, but... In real life, they're not restricted to a tile pattern like this. They're also not restricted to using certain track types. They can pretty much use whatever they want. If the track type that they want to use doesn't exist, they just invent a new one and they use that instead. Um, in terms of routing, it's a lot easier to route, I would say, in real life than it is on this game. 
because for example you see here I'm just navigating my way around the town uh, in real life they'll just build a curve like a, a really nice horseshoe shaped curve that will go around the town they also make things like landscaping a little bit easier as well so in some ways I am envious of modern rail builders I mean you look at Crossrail they have literally just taken tunnel boring machines st stuck them in a um, a hole in the ground and then just driven them underneath central London now I have already built my circle line there will be a couple of other metro lines that crisscross the city but the majority of the metro trains are going to be using that circle line the reason uh, I think it's easier in real life is because on this game you can't build stations underground uh, I think there is a GRF where you can do it but it kind of messes with the game it doesn't really look like something I'd want to use anyway but uh, as I say in real life you just build a station underground simple as that so there are some differences um, I wouldn't go ahead and say that it's easier on the game than it is in real life nor would I say it's easier in real life than it is in the game I think it very much depends on what you're trying to do I know for a fact that when I'm building long lines like this I would rather use a cities in motion type track builder where it's a double or quadruple track uh, so in this case it would be quadruple and then you just click on the start point you click at various midpoints and then you click at the end point and it's done it, it's built that makes life a heck of a lot easier I'm also coming in at a really funny angle for this town I'm not quite sure why I decided to go this far over I need to go there like this there we go right so say that was the first topic of conversation the next topic and I don't I don't want to be playing devil's advocate I don't want to be saying that people are right or wrong in, in any way I just like to present an, an opposite opinion so the second comment which I want to respond to is also from Wayne and I believe it was on episode 103 nope 101 so he, he says this time, I love the idea of us, Britain, getting a modern rail system, but you know all the excuses that will be raised to stop it from happening. Had decades to alter bridge heights, most I've seen have been updated in the past 20 years and other infrastructure, but kept with the old ways. Oh well, we'll keep trundling along with our high speed trains, single carriage, etc. Pity we don't need the world rail wires anymore. Keep up the great work with your vids, trying to keep up to date with these, blah blah blah. That bit's by the by. It's the bit in the middle that I found really interesting. We'll keep trundling along with our high speed trains. He's put high speed in inverted commas and that's the bit that I want to uh, take exception to, shall we say. Again, I'm not saying that anyone's right or wrong. I'm just presenting a different opinion. In my opinion, the high speed trains are one of the greatest inventions of the modern world. Reason being, up until that point, there were no real high speed DMU trains in the world and not only are the high speed trains still in use 50 years after they were first created which kind of maybe does say a little something about um, the British rail system but in 19 what year were they invented or what year were they started to run I have got it up here I did some research how cool is this I actually did some research in preparation for this episode. I've just got to wait for the page to reload. But what I can tell you is the high-speed train, the HSTs, those old grubby things that you see going up and down the country, they are the fastest diesel trains in the world. Uh, by quite a long way as well, if I recall. Their top speed, their absolute top speed, is 148 miles an hour. To put that in context, the new class 800s, 801s and 802s that are coming in soon, uh, you might recognize them as the Virgin Azuma. Their top speed operating speed, I should say, is 140 miles an hour. Now, operating speed is different to maximum speed. Operating speed is the, the speed at which they're allowed to run on the actual rail network. Operating and uh, maximum speed is how fast they can actually go. So if you really push an HST, it can go 148 miles an hour 
And I believe, again, because operating speed does not mean maximum speed that it can operate safely. It's just the speed that the signalling system on the track allows it to operate at. So I believe that the HSTs can actually operate at 140 miles an hour in relative safety and comfort. So you put high speed in inverted commas, in actual fact, they're not that slow. You know, the Javelins as well, high speed one, the maximum speed that a domestic train can run on high speed one is 140 miles an hour. I believe that's for the Javelins and for Eurostar as well. So now suddenly an HST doesn't look so slow after all. Um, and I was quite impressed when I read about this because I did used to think that the HSTs were old and slow and badly need of replacing. But actually, they're dark horses, I would say. Put them in a race against an electric equivalent and you'll find that there isn't that much difference between them. Um, which is, you know, we are the leaders when it comes to that. Not just that, yes there are no British train building companies in existence anymore. BREL's gone bankrupt or they got sold off, I can't actually remember the uh, the full story behind that. BREL was um, British Railways Engineering... Damn it, I've forgotten the name of that one as well. Uh, here you go, I'm just going to get the year that the HSTs were f first brought into service. Nineteen seventy five the first one was built. Nineteen eighty two the last one was built. Maximum speed is hundred and twenty five miles per hour service speed, hundred and forty eight miles per hour record speed. That wasn't with a specially fitted train either, like the TGVs. Um T G V always cheats when it comes to speed records, by the way. If you actually look it up, they I think they hold the record for actual passenger runs. But the majority of the time that a TGV sets a world record, it's a special train that's been specially made for that special occasion. Which in my book is cheating. You're not doing it... It's like um, when you talk about footballers and you say they'll do it on a cold rainy night in Stoke. You know, they're not exactly doing it in revenue earning service. So it doesn't count in my book. But again, that's a controversial opinion, I'm sure. Anyway... The point I'm making is, the HSTs, they're not all that bad. If you actually sit and read about them, you'll find out they're not all that bad at all. Same with um, railway electrification in Great Britain. The reason we have these slow pacers and, and um, sprinters and things like that is, yes, in that sense, British Rail is a little bit behind the rest of the world. Um... Again, this is an old figure, so it might have been updated since. But in 2006, only 40% of the British Rail Network was electrified. Uh, but 60% of all rail journeys were made by electric traction. So that gives you a fair idea as to the fact there are limited services. What am I doing? There are limited services on some of these um, non-electrified routes. But on top of that... 64% uh, of the electrified network uses overhead catenary and 36% uses DC third rail systems. So, yeah, I agree with you there. We're a little bit behind. But in terms of British Railways as a whole, I will always be an advocate for, for British Railways. You look at Crossrail, it is the largest infrastructure project in Europe at the moment not just in Britain in Europe that is an achievement you have to admit that is a big achievement the new trains are some of the fastest uh, EMUs for commuter services ever built they operate at 90 miles per hour when you think about that that's probably faster than I'd say 75 percent of the world yes we have high-speed lines in Europe like Germany and France they have high-speed lines but then you look at other countries around the world, India, they have a huge rail network, hardly any of it is high speed. Russia, huge rail network, hardly any of it is high speed. The only other one really outside Europe that can compete with the rest of Europe is Japan. With the uh, the, the uh, bullet trains. Shinkan Shinkansen? I don't want to butcher the uh, Japanese language. You guys know what they're called. 
So once again, um, <clears throat> I will I will fight anyone that says British Railways is going down the pan. It's not. It's one of the reasons why I don't want the railways to be renationalised. Is because I think actually that will be harmful to uh, to the progress that's been made since privatisation. I would hate to see the railways renationalised now. Things like Crossrail would never have happened under British Railways. So uh, the, the longer we keep away from that again, the happier I will be, that's for sure. Right, this, incidentally, this little station that I'm building here, um, why is that? I think I've done something wrong here. Oh, I know what I've done wrong. I'm supposed to be cut back slightly. Uh, so yeah, British Railways. We are still the world's best. So we might not have British companies building British trains as such, but in Britain we have high-speed trains being built by Hitachi in uh, Durham, County Durham, Newton Aycliffe. Uh, we've got the Bombardier factory in Derby, which are building the trains for Crossrail. They've also built the new trains on the London Underground Network, as well as some of the old trains on the London Underground Network. They've built the Metropolitan District Circle and Hammersmith and City Line trains. Um, once Crossrail trains have been built, Bombardier will be building the brand new trains again in Derby for the Greater Anglia services out of Liverpool Street into places like Norwich and Ipswich um, where else? I think Colchester they might be going to and you know other places like that once Hitachi have finished building the uh, the new high speed trains the Intercity Express program they'll be building new, new trains for ScotRail they'll also be building new trains for GWR uh, and a few others along the way as well so these places Brexit might have a little say on on how long they um, stick around for, but at the moment it looks as though these companies are going to be around for a long, long time building trains, and they're doing it in Britain using British workers. So it's kind of like with the car industry. We don't have British companies, you know. Hitachi is Japanese, Bombardier is Canadian, but French Canadian, I should say, but their factories are built in Britain and we're going to be building trains for all over the world not just in in Britain which I think is is a sign that actually we're not doing so bad when it comes to uh, when it comes to the British rail industry people will always make it sound worse than it actually is that's kind of their job that's what they do so there's always going to be a politician somewhere that's making out like we're really struggling and they'll throw some fake figures at the problem to make it sound really extreme especially when there's an election on the horizon but in actuality if you look at it properly you'll see that it, it really isn't that bad yes Britain were once a long way behind the rest of the world we were still using steam when everyone else had upgraded to high speed electric but now it's a different story we're using the most modern signalling in the world. We're also using the most modern rail in the world, most modern uh, trains in the world. Again, going back to Crossrail, they're bringing in all new types of um, track, particularly if you read about the Barbican, how they've built Crossrail underneath the Barbican Theatre. That's revolutionary, not really been done before elsewhere. Other Projects like it might exist, but nothing quite like how they've actually chosen to do it. Um, interestingly, Crossrail trains are going to be the first new trains for quite some time that don't have the yellow front end. And boy, am I happy to see that, because trust me, I hate the yellow front end on trains. I'm glad that's something we're getting rid of. Uh, something else which is quite revolutionary. Anyone who knows what the Hartford Loop Line is, I think I might have mentioned it in these videos before. 
The Hartford Loop Line is a line that goes from Alexandra Palace via Hartford North to Stevenage. It's like a branch of the East Coast Main Line. They are currently running trials on that part of the Main Line to use the ER... T oh God, ERTMS? Yeah, ERTMS Level 2 signalling system, which is the European Railway Train Traffic Management System. Uh, if you ever see in-cab signalling on high-speed trains, including the Javelins and indeed Eurostar and TGV, um, it uses a very similar system to what is currently being tested. It's the little blue sign with the... that's actually called TVM. Again, I'm sort of doing uh, research on the fly here. Yeah, TVM is the little blue sign with the yellow triangle, but it comes underneath the bracket of uh, traffic management systems. So that is currently being trialled on the Hartford line, Hartford Loop line, and that's going to be brought onto the East Coast main line around about the same time that the Zoomers are going to be starting up. So that's going to be a huge piece of progress as well. I mean, I mean that's massive development. Proper high-speed rail on what is essentially at the moment an ordinary route. So we are not behind the rest of the world in any stretch of the imagination. We are at least level with the majority, if not ahead. And I think that is a huge deal. I mean, yes, we will never have a, a rail network quite like they have in Germany, for example, or France, or at a push, Spain and Italy. One of the reasons being, we're not big enough. We're a tiny country in comparison to the majority of European countries. I mean, you think about France and the high-speed rail network in France, we'll never have anything that big because we are tiny when compared to France. Currently, our only true high-speed rail network links London to the south coast, which is a bit like linking London to a town 50 miles north of London. It doesn't make that much of a difference, granted. High Speed 2 will change all of that when it hopefully gets um, green flagged and actually built. And when it finally opens in 2032, I think was the date that I first saw, which is a long time from now, admittedly. That's one thing I'm a little bit annoyed about, is they've taken so long to do it that the economic reasons behind it are fading fast. Um, but if it ever does get built, we'll become world leaders again. Because that will be a, a proper high-speed integrated network that will link London with the rest of the country. All the way up to Glasgow when Phase 2 is completed. And Edinburgh, of course. And perhaps even beyond that if they decide to to integrate that in too. One thing I, I want from that though, which I think would would make it even better, is if they actually had it so that once um, High Speed 2 was completed and running, they actually linked High Speed 2 to High Speed 1. So you could get on a train in, let's say, Manchester and it will take you straight to mainland Europe. That is when it will really become um, a standout and we will become world leaders because at the moment if you live in London you're only a few a few hours away from the rest of mainland Europe if you go on a train at St Pancras you're two and a half hours away from Paris that is quite something um, the longest rail tunnel in the world underwater is the Channel Tunnel again I think the Japanese might have something to say on that they're in the works of building something Plus, there's plans to build the um, tunnel under... Uh, I can't remember the name of the body of water now, but it's going to link Alaska and Russia, which again could perhaps take the record. But I'm sure if I typed into Google now, longest underwater rail tunnel... Longest underwater tunnel... 
Oh, it's not. It is the Seacan Tunnel. I wondered if it was the Seacan Tunnel. Yeah, that is in Japan. <coughs> Fair enough. Something that really saddens me is... This is a list of the top 10 underwater tunnels in the world. Number 10 is the Thames Tunnel. And the reason that saddens me is because it was one of Brunel's greatest ever achievements. And this is Brunel Sr. Um, Mark Brunel. Mark Isambard Brunel. Uh, he led the project to build the Thames Tunnel. And it was the world's first tunnel under a navigable river when it first opened. Back in... 1843 and I'm not I'm cheating I'm looking at my screen to get these facts it's 0.4 kilometers long which doesn't sound like that much but it was the first tunnel under a navigable river that's a huge thing to have happened you'll never see that um, kind of engineering again the way that Brunel designed the shield the great shield that they used to dig out the tunnel um, countless number of times it was flooded Isambard Kingdom Brunel and he died uh, in one particular flooding and yet they persevered they stuck with it which you'd never see in this day and age as soon as something goes wrong in this day and age it'll be shut down and it'll never they'll never do it again um, but in the end it was successful it opened it worked and you know many many people now cross under the Thames using the Thames tunnel every day the reason I find it so sad is because it's now part of the overground network so, yes, it's still used, but all the lights that were once in there are hardly ever used these days. Um, maybe when there's maintenance or that kind of thing. I find it a little bit sad that something that was so great when it first existed now isn't so great at all. Uh, it's just part of normal like life. That's what I find sad. And I'm sort of losing my chain of thought here because I'm building at the same time and we all know how well that goes. I'm also just realising that I perhaps should build this link first. Actually that's something that I should build. Let's get rid of that bit. I'm also going to get rid of this bit. I'm going to move that one to there. Yeah, that's better. And we're going to move that there. And this signal, we're going to move to there. Fowie? we? No, we're going to move it back a little bit. To there. So yeah, Thames Tunnel. <coughs> Was the first, and now it's just part. But it's still on the top ten list of underwater tunnels. Rail tunnels, that is. Which is still quite something. Actually, it looks like this is just longest tunnels underwater. Because uh, 9 and 8 are both um, road tunnels. 7 is the 7 tunnel. That's ironic. 3.62 kilometers long. Still in operation. HSTs run through it every day. Now that tunnel, I think it's somewhere between 10 and 20 gallons of water are pumped out of the, the uh, 7 tunnel every single day. It gets very wet down there. One of the reasons is because when it was built, they didn't really anticipate the amount of water that would actually flood in. There's a lot of water in the Severn, Severn Estuary. It's the Bristol Channel, for those of you that aren't aware. Uh, it's also the big body of water that links England and Wales. Again, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, I'm aware of the fact that there are lots of people who watch these videos who aren't from Britain. So probably wondering what the hell I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, there. that was an impressive tunnel when it first opened. Still exists. Still used. It's currently being upgraded as part of the electrification. Another reason why Britain is great. We are currently electrifying uh, more railways. Something that does, again, bug me. And it's embarrassing in some respects is when... And this is where Wayne is right. They've started electrifying routes in the past and they've moved bridges. Like they've they've had to raise the height of bridges to allow overhead wires to go underneath. And they finished the project. They're about to reopen the wherever it is that runs over the bridge. And then someone suddenly goes, 
that's not the right height and then they have to start all over again that is quite bad I'll agree with that one I mean that's just someone's put a decimal point in the wrong place pretty much um, I mean it's bad it's really bad someone should lose their job over that but at the same time it's not like the end of the world you know worse things have happened right I'm just thinking I mean this part of the line isn't actually supposed to be built yet but I'm just looking we have an odd number of tracks coming through here so I think what I might do is that basically I've got to link all of these lines together I'm going to go into a bit of building mode now um, less chatting more building I would say because this episode is going to be a long one again otherwise which some people don't mind some people absolutely despise so I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet if I can or shorter and sweeter I should say so I'm going to connect that one there and I'm going to connect this one like this I mean, the whole point I was trying to make with that whole monologue is a lot of people put British Railways down. Uh, not the company, that doesn't exist. Well, it kind of exists. I think the last assets are still being sold off as we speak. But a lot of people try and put the railways in Britain down. Um, British people do it, mostly. And I never really understand why. Because, yes, there are things like rail strikes and trains end up being late and people end up being late for work I totally get that that's when it's bad but when you think about how far we've come and other countries might be ahead of us now sure and they might have bragging rights over us so what we started it that's the main thing everything that these countries can boast about they wouldn't have any of it if it wasn't for the UK we started what was at the time a revolution and one that's still being felt across the world and it's something that all Brits should be proud of because without without any of that hard work no country would have bragging rights and I still think Britain in its own unique way like the, the London Underground I think is the best underground system in the world. It's got that unique quirkiness that no other underground system can boast. And I know there will be people that are angry about me saying that. And I'm sure that the comment section is going to be rife with people saying, oh, but surely New York is better, or surely Moscow is better, or surely Paris is better. But is it really? Or is it? Is there a bias? I'm slightly biased. I'm from near London. You know, I'm, I'm slightly biased when it comes to which one's the best. But at the same time, I do feel like there are certain parts of the London Underground that no other country in the world can match. For example, it was the first. The world's first underground railway was built in London. No one can take that away from us. Much as they may try. So I think that is something to be immensely proud of and it's constantly growing which is something else that um, other transit systems are doing this as well. I'm not saying that London is the only one that's expanding but London is the one that's expanding in unique ways. So for example currently there are plans to extend the Bakerloo line. Um, there are also, I've just realised I've completely messed this up. Actually, yeah, I really have completely messed this up. Let me take that back and start again, shall we? Um, what I need to do is this one needs to run underneath like that. And then this one will join up with it here. So, yeah, the uh, the Bakerloo line is currently being extended um, to Battersea, I want to say. the Hang on. The northern line is also being extended. I 
to Clapham Junction. Oh, I know, the Northern Line is extending to Battersea. The Bakerloo Line this is what happens when I try and remember things from memory. The Bakerloo Line is going to Lewisham, that's right. Where it will connect with the DLR, which is another unique part of um, London that not many other countries can boast. They might have driverless trains, but we have the DLR. That's what I'll always say. And I'm going to be one of those really, really arrogant, ignorant people that's not going to admit that there might be another country that's got it better than us. I know for a fact that New York, as much as I want to like the New York um, subway, I can't ever. Because it's there's some things about it that are so weird. Like, I'm not really sure what the decision makers were thinking when they made these decisions, but there's... Uh, one thing I've never really understood about the New York subway is why does every single carriage look like it's the end of the train? Like, it, uh, that does, does not make sense to me. A train is a train. You know, if it's a series of cars that's connected to form a train, then yeah, that can still be classed as a train. But in this modern day and age, why have they got all of these subway cars that first of all look like they were built in the 19... I don't know, 20s. They're a bit... They don't look nice, do they? They're not the nicest looking trains in the world. Second of all, why does it look like that... Um, hang on, let me just get this signalling done. Why does it look like they're all the end of the train? Really? Who's, whose decision was that? Not the nicest. Anyway, this is our train care facility. So for now, I'm just going to call this Guard City West. Train care. Right, so that is this part of the episode done. And the topics of conversation are pretty much done as well. <clears throat> I will leave it as if anyone has any opinions on anything that I've waffled on about, if anyone's been able to keep up with what I've been waffling on, because trust me, I've struggled too. Um, comment section is what it's for. Talk about your own countries, talk about other people's countries. Obviously, don't be offensive, because that will get you in trouble with me. But apart from that, let, let us know your opinions. That's what the whole comment section is for. It's for people who who want to get their voice heard. I always like conversation in my videos because it feels like I'm engaging with the audience then. Um, so you know this this whole topic for today's episode was inspired by what well, was essentially someone knocking Britain's railways but we've all done it. We all get frustrated and we all say oh this is useless. Trust me it could be a lot worse. Once upon a time our rail was nationalised. That would have been a hell of a lot worse. Luckily I'm just young enough to not remember the majority of British Rail. I just remember the end of it. 1994 was when preservation, uh, preservation, privatisation first really started. So I'm just old enough to remember Network South East trains going past. But uh, besides that, you know, it's pretty much a bygone era for me. I look at what we've got now. Yeah, okay, I don't know what it was, would have been like back in the day, but I have a fairly strong feeling that it would not be as good as what we've got now. There'll be more strikes for a start. I'm fully aware of what uh, British Rail was like when it came to strikes. I've seen enough documentaries about that, believe me. I mean, things, even things like uh, the whole Southern Strike is all about driver-only operation. That's something that we're trying to get going in Britain at the moment is um, driver-only operation. One of the things I don't understand about why they're striking is the franchise is run by Govia. Govia run other franchises where driver-only operation is already in existence. That's the bit that does not quite compute with me is why they're striking over something that already exists in their company. 
It's something to do with um, Gatwick Express services being driver operation only, which basically means there's no guard to check tickets or operate the doors or anything like that. It's mostly to do with door operation, and the reason they're striking is for health and safety reasons. And I understand that, and I think that's fair enough. But there are some times where I just think the unions strike for the sake of striking. Um, like, there was a brief mention a few years ago of uh, driverless tube trains, and within two weeks there were strikes on the tube in protest against it. You know, they're, they're not doing themselves any favours as far as I'm concerned. Like, they don't want trains to be driverless, but there's striking to stop trains running at all which from a business point of view will just make the company want to bring in driverless trains sooner because driverless trains don't strike people operating them in the uh, or people monitoring them in the signal boxes and the control centers might strike but uh, that's another story so yeah we're not perfect British Rails isn't perfect there's loads of things that I wish we would just get on with. Um, I've said this in the previous episodes, but the whole debate about High Speed 2 and its its route. Um, I think, yes, we have to preserve uh, views, sight lines, things like that. That's fine. I understand that. But it's got to the stage now, and I think it was George De Silva mentioned this in a comment as well, where some of the longest tunnels in the country are going to be built under countryside. Like in in my head, a tunnel always has to go under something, like a big hill maybe, or a mountain, or um, buildings, whatever it might be. A tunnel goes under something. At this rate, high speed two is going to have a series of tunnels that go over, uh, go under nothing, literally nothing, just some trees and some grassland. And it's done to protect the. Uh, protect the views especially in the Chilton area that's where the majority of these tunnels are going to go and I totally understand why um, these views want to be or why people want these views to be protected that is absolutely fine not got a problem with that but I can't help but think that when the railways first appeared back in the 1800s um, especially where the Seven Valley runs through a particular area the landowner insisted that um, the, the railway was built in a tunnel through his land so that it wouldn't spoil the view. Within a few weeks of the railway opening, he started cutting down trees so he could get a better view of the trains. I don't, I'm not saying that's going to happen with High Speed 2, because let's face it, High Speed trains, as, as pretty as they can be, they're never going to be um, the same as a... I'm actually going to leave that as a junction there. They're never going to be the same as a, as a steam train. However maybe we could end up in a similar position in the future where people are actually cutting cutting back trees to get a better view of the railway it has happened before there's no reason why it can't happen again I would find that quite funny if that ended up happening it's all about perspective that's kind of what this episode is all about really is it's about perspective from wherever your viewpoint is things look different and that's what makes this world so great. So as I said, right at the very start, there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. It is entirely down to opinion. Um, and I, I urge you to remember that in the comments section as well. If someone has said something that you don't particularly agree with, don't call them an idiot or anything like that. Because just because you have a different opinion doesn't mean your opinion is the right one. Um, I'm sure lots of people know that anyway and I have to say that throughout my YouTube career I don't think I've met anyone who's who's been really really nasty in the comments section to myself or anyone else so I feel quite privileged in that sense but always remember when you're commenting on one of my videos is its opinion there's no right answer there's no wrong answer no one's rated above anybody else as far as I'm concerned it's always about opinion. So, with that in mind, uh, went a bit deep there, didn't we? 
we're pretty much done with this part of the line as you can see we are terminating at this station which if you remember from where's the buffer that I'm looking for there it is if you remember from last episode this is going to be the site of our new airport which I don't think we can build no we still can't build any hub airports but we'll put that there so this is um, guard city great wind field airport GGWA it'll probably be shortened to just GWA right this branch here will connect up with the main line over here so there will be a way to get from the western main line into the suburban line if possible it'll probably be used mostly for freight reasons though I would say um, boy this took longer than I thought this bridge is here by the way you might be wondering why I just built a random bridge the four track main line is going to come through it's going to go under that bridge there's going to be a station here and there's going to be a station here two different stations almost like they're competing companies right we now need to build signals here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten there and there all the way along like this all the way up to the junction which is over here it's worked out quite well for me actually one two three four five six seven eight nine ten right and the metro the south bank line links up with this line here as well I believe uh, where is it here so it will link up might do it just after Barston or maybe after Grinbourne or maybe just before Plin Hill I don't know yet but this is the South Bank line runs all the way through here runs onto the metro here runs through South Bank and then out the other side as you will remember from last episode as for this episode guys we've pretty much reached the end so we've built the Great Western line out of GSP as far as Great Winfield we have also built the Western Suburban line to meet the Great Western line at Great Winfield so that is it for this episode off camera um, I might start getting some trains to run yeah just checking that I haven't got that scheduled for a future episode I might start getting some trains running between Great Winfield and possibly I'm just thinking this goes up onto the loop doesn't it so I might have yet another train service using the loop but I'm actually looking at it I might build another junction so that it will use these platforms but actually it will come off from this side of the loop maybe or I'll just have it come through from over here I'm kind of thinking of reconfiguring this junction because I don't like the fact that there's only two lines from here that go through Shoreham and the other four go off down this way something which I have done over here by the way is doubled these bridges I said I was going to do it a long time ago never really did it I have done it now um, I've also electrified this it was originally catenary it's now third rail which is quite irritating again if anyone can help me fix that problem I will be hugely grateful because that make life a lot easier uh, eventually I'm going to quadruple these bridges as well this is a bit of a train flow problem at the moment so um, the sooner I can get that fixed the better but yeah I will be running new services somehow using the loop not really sure where from though um, and then next episode we're building the main line from GSMA south to Fort Flunwood to connect with Western Suburbia at Chunston which is here except we won't be connecting we'll actually be doing a little bit of a divergence there and then we'll be building the Dinstown branch of the main line via Dintown so if you look at 
So where's Fort Flonwood? Fort Flonwood would be at the base of this. Big city. First big city on any of the main lines that we've built to so far. Um, and then... So the, the main line will be going round this way. And then this is the Dintown branch named after Dintown, which is there. So we'll be doing that in the next episode. I don't know whether it will be a time lapse or not just yet, but uh, obviously by the time the video rolls around you will know. But until then guys, once again I would like to stress if anyone can help me with that problem with getting tracks into this game, better tracks into this game, uh, please let me know in the comments section. Uh, I would greatly appreciate that. It won't be for another week until I can actually factor that into the new episodes because as you know I'm recording these a week or so in advance now but I would really really appreciate it if someone can help me out with that problem but apart from that it is time to end so thank you very much for watching don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video and of course if you enjoyed the series drop some comments down below with ideas for future episodes also check out the naming suggestion list because we do want to start renaming some stuff soon the only reason I keep putting it off is because I haven't got any suggestions so if you have any name suggestions go ahead and use the sheet it's what it's there for uh, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, be sure to hit the subscribe button. If you have already subscribed to the channel, then thank you guys for your continued support. And until next time, I will see you soon.